Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. Hey, so today we're going to talk about corporate training doesn't have to stink. That's right. <laughs> and I think most of us have probably been through some pretty stinky corporate training. Have you ever been through some training that doesn't or that's uh, bad? Yeah. Not only have I been through it, I've had to conduct it myself. And you're looking at this stuff and you're like, God, but you know, you we say, are guilty. We're saying it doesn't have to stink. But with all the stinky training, won't the good training feel left out? <laughs> <laughs> it's like. What was this, this joke about Abraham Lincoln was visiting a jail? Like, I think this might be a true story. I don't know. It was in this Abraham Lincoln joke book I had as a kid. And he's visiting all these criminals. And, you know, it's like, oh, what, what are you in here? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, the next guy, I didn't do it. And he gets this guy. Oh, yeah, I did it. And, you know, I got to serve my time. And he's like, we got to get this guy out of here. <laughs> he didn't fit in. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So yeah, we're going to talk about that training that doesn't stink that's out there. And we're going to talk about what training is and why it matters. We're going to talk about some ways to design training so that it actually helps people learn. And we're going to talk about some key takeaways for people, leaders, and organizations. So let's kick it off with that first topic, which is what is training? Why does it matter? So in your own words, Chris Everett, what, what's training about? Well, okay. So I think about, because I come out of IT, right? I think about this in the knowledge management pyramid, which people should go Google. Like at the bottom of the pyramid's information, right? And then on top of that is knowledge, right? And then you get, you turn that into data, right? Or I forget how it goes, but you're, you're, you're at the base level's data, right? And it, like if a tree fell in the wood, would anybody hear it? If there was information that nobody picked up and taught, would anybody learn it? Mm. Probably not, right? So training is about helping people hone current skills. So this is stuff that they can already do to different levels of quality or efficiency or something, or to develop all new skills. Right. So it's different than taking a college course on Civil War history. Right. It's yeah. So because that would be getting the information. Right. So, you know, like in college, you, you get a bunch of information, get a bunch of information. Then maybe towards your senior years or master's Ph.D., you learn to start putting that information together and start, you know, maybe drawing conclusions, using it to help you make decisions, those kinds of things. Right. So there's a great article that we'll post a link to in the show notes from Herman Aguinness and Kurt Krager. And they wrote this a couple of years ago, but it's still very relevant. And it's called Benefits of Training and Development for Individuals and Teams, Organizations and Society. And this was in the annual review of psychology. And in that article, they provide some good definitions here. So what they write as their definition of training is as follows. And I quote, the systematic approach to affecting individuals' knowledge, skills and attitudes in order to improve individual team and organizational effectiveness. Right. So in that definition, you can see this uh, focus on the organization and doing something for the organization's of, uh, objectives, so to speak. So if you're an organization, you probably should figure out what kinds of knowledge, skills, and abilities do we want to, or attitudes do we want to affect among our people. Development, on, on the other hand, is, and, and I quote again, systematic efforts affecting individuals' knowledge or skills for purposes of personal growth or future jobs and or roles. So it's a little bit longer term focused. Uh, it's not necessarily about specific things that are going to improve the team's effectiveness right now. Uh, but that's what training is. And training matters. Training is an important thing. We'll go out there on the record as saying this, and we'll have some caveats to kind of, you know, training as a, as a panacea for all organizational ills. But uh, what are some reasons why training matters, Chris? Well, let me just say, first of all, you got to have a concept of training. It The training doesn't, I mean, it goes off accidentally all the time. Well, I guess I'll show Filson how to do this thing, right? Right. But if, you know, when in that definition, it's the systematic approach. If you want to mm. achieve these positive outcomes, you need to be disciplined, not only in your thinking, but in your planning, your execution, your reviewing and improving your attempt. Because, you know, you're talking about why does it matter? What well, daggone supports higher job performance? 
Right. And everybody's like, well, I, I wish we just can't get good health around here, you know, <laughs> which is kind of a translation of that hey, performance out of people in my organization is not where I want it, which sounds a lot less numbskully. And that's what we're aiming for, right? Is not to be numbskulls. And two, you want better performance out of your employees? Well, training is going to play a key part in it. Right. And, you know, you can go through the, the literature and find many studies and you know, empirical support, theoretical support for the idea that having a more robust set of human capital in your organization, you know, the knowledge and skills of your people, uh, that that is a good thing for your organization. And it's actually a good thing for society overall. And this happens a lot of times through our organizations. And that's kind of another thing that that I think is a, a benefit of training. But, you know, if done well, and of course, we're that's the big if here. Good training supports higher job performance. Good training can be good for satisfaction and morale and commitment. You know, just in general, people like to master skills. They it feels good, you know. So, for example, Chris, you know, you you take on a couple of guitar students once in a while and, you know, as they learn stuff, does it seem to be something that they enjoy? Yeah. No, they, that's, that's why I keep a few students. Now I don't have to make money off of teaching lessons, but I've devoted so many, gosh, thousands of thousands of hours and playing professionally and stuff that I get a lot of fulfillment continuing to develop my skills. But then I also keep myself sharp by sharing it with other people. And so generally my students, you know, they'll come in for an hour or two lesson. And then it's like, all right, here's the next things you got to work on. Come back when you're ready for the next lesson. But watching those aha moments, I mean, it's probably why I enjoy what we do so much with organizations and coaching individuals. It's we're continually seeing people because I think, Ben, I mean, would you agree? It started off with us being like, oh, my gosh, yes, this piece of information or knowledge or ability is amazing. Gosh, I can't wait to go. Sh it's like when you eat something good. Here, try this. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, another reason why training really matters is that, you know, the, the work environment, uh, business in general, industries, technology, these are always changing. And you need to keep up as an organization, unless you're just going to continually hire new skills in by just firing the people who don't have the skills you need and getting new folks all the time. Better have a big credit card. I mean, that's, that. yeah, that, that's just not sustainable. So what you've got to do as an organization, if you want to keep up with the changing external environment is you've got to invest in training and you've got to help your folks continually develop their skills, continually develop their knowledge and, uh, and also, um, you know, their attitudes in order to be more uh, productive as members of your organization. So th that's another benefit. Yeah. And you got to carve time out for this. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is it, there's just somewhat structural and somewhat the numbskullery. Thanks Cogswell for that word, but <laughs> the numbskullery that we, see out there where it's like, okay, I'm charted. Or if they're a new manager and their preparation's not ready for the kind of triage they're going to have to do when like now they have a hundred things on their plate rather than two. But it's a, okay, we're going to hire this guy. All right, here's the one job you got to do. Go do it. And hey, you need to perform better. Hey, stop stinking. And, and there's no help for that person. And then that person, let's say they come in, they thrive. They're the best one on it. And they want to move up with the, in the organization. Sorry, we we just want you to be a brick in the wall. Mm -hmm. um, I see this from everywhere and how they do call center, call center training and all this kinds of stuff. You know, on one hand, we say in our society, you can move on up. And then on the second hand, we have whole swaths of people saying um, you should buy into the system. It's a good idea. But by the way, no training. And you're going to have to like stab, kill and stomp, boot stomp your way up to the top here. I, I don't know if that's the best. That's not the kind of society I prefer to live in. And it's not something because one of the things as a manager that you got to develop is the ability to develop others. Right, right. And if you don't, then you're putting yourself at risk for derailing as a, as a leader. You know, organizations spend quite a bit of money on training, um, according to the Association for Talent Development, and we'll post a link to their organization. That's kind of the global organization that is devoted to the, the function and the craft of training and development. Um, according to, they, they do the state of the industry 
thing every year. And uh, their most recent one suggested that organizations spend on average about $1,299 per employee per year on training. So about $1,300 per year on training. If you multiply that out of over workforce, that's quite a bit. Uh, so you got to make it worth it. And you know, don't have stinky training. You want training that actually influences learning behavior. You know, that's kind of a different approach toward training that I have and you have, Chris, you know, as management consultants coming from the field of management, from the field of organizational psychology, we want training to actually change behavior. And I contrast this a little bit in jest with the lawyer approach, right? <laughs> you know, so and I, I love attorneys. I, I have a deep respect and fascination with, with the law. I've considered going to law school many times myself. My wife tells me I'm too old to do that. But yeah, um, that would be a terminal degree for you, Ben. I, you don't finish it because your wife kills you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, but but it's interesting. When you do talk with attorneys about training, a lot of times it's about risk mitigation. It's saying, you know, have you done your sexual harassment training? Have you done this type of training? In order, essentially- CYA. To have, right, to have some sort of record of someone having done the training so that in the event that they do some- Numb scullery. If they start acting like a jack wagon in your organization, you can say you were trained. You know, we, and now we... you're fired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This yeah, is it. us setting you up for success. I mean, look right. at the hostile relationship. Like, listen, yeah. we're going to do these things. You better pay attention and write all this down. And here's your checklist. Because if you cross that line, yeah. buddy, you're out of here. And that's the difference between compliance and really engagement. And you know, I'm sure that there are. There are attorneys out there do amazing training and support amazing training. They they're smart enough, you know. Lawyers are pretty smart. They get what I'm talking about here. That you actually want people to change for the right reasons. And there is an element of risk mitigation that you do want to, you know, have records that you've trained done it, done your employee safety training and other types of things. Uh, but you know, our approach here in this podcast and our approach just as as individuals when we go out and work with organizations is we want training that actually changes behavior. And so let's move now to but talk. Let's, to, let's oh, hone yeah. on that for a sec, okay. Ben. How many times have we gone in and had an exec say, how do you get people to stop or to be more mm. or to, right? And these are all behavioral questions. We don't ever get like, how do you get an employee to know how to change a light bulb or to log into their system and enter a proper um, accounting entry? We, we right. never get those questions. Like, how do you get, and it's always, how, they're always behavioral questions. Yet when we look at their training, their development, all that kind of stuff, there's next to no behavioral pieces there. It's all right. that hard quantity stuff, which is fine. You got to have training for hard quantity stuff. But on, on one, the easiest things to do, right? Every I seldom see somebody train at a task level event, struggle to accomplish that. They wouldn't be an organization. But they do struggle with the behavioral, yet they don't address it. Right. Sorry, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. So an example there would be, you know, I could, training people, someone on something technical, right, versus training someone on, you know, and I hate this term, but a lot of people use it, the soft skills. You know, the soft skills are really very hard, you know, um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, the things like leadership skills and how do we be more adaptable as people and as teams? How do you develop a team? All those types of things can be really tricky, but certainly training can help. At the same time, I do want to throw a cautionary note out there because you and I come across organizations all the time that come at us with some sort of issue that they have and say, yeah, and they define the problem in terms of the, the solution, right? By saying, hey, we need some training. It's like, do you really need some training? Or yeah, do you our need spidey senses else? go boop, boop, yeah. boop, boop, um, boop. And, <laughs> and sometimes training might be a component of what that organization needs. However, organizations very frequently take training as this kind of knee-jerk reaction to something that either like went poorly or you know some sort of incident. They're like, hey, we need to do some training. You know, that's going to fix things. Well, maybe that'll fix some things, but it's not necessarily going to fix everything. So. You know, bad training is also worse than no training at all, right? So we're, we're focusing here on how to make training that doesn't stink. So maybe we can turn our attention there to, you know, how can we design training so it actually helps people learn and do stuff differently? Well, yeah. So, you know, the hard skill stuff, I think most people have, and you can have some on the job for that kind of stuff. But that this other stuff that people are missing that they tend to come to us for is there needs to be a compelling why. And... If, you're, if your why is so you don't get fired, well, I guess that's pretty compelling. But 
that's like, you know, hey, kid, go clean your room or I'm going to beat you. <laughs> so that kid may do it because they don't want to get beat. But what the heck kind of family life is that? Right. Yeah, right. What kind of org life is that? So why are they learning this? What's in it for them? Like. You know, any time that we've conducted a training and people are really interested in the material, it's, you know, they're asking quality questions. They're staying after. They're they're displaying that thing that every org wants that struggles to capture called engagement. Mm. Right? And and it's starting off with a compelling why. Why are mm. we doing this? Yeah. You know, just to take like a topic that's near and dear to our ho- our hearts, which is you know, the topic of organizational agility, for example. Right. You know, so I wrote a, a, a white paper um, with our friend Scott Bible uh, for the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology on ag- agile and agility and why it matters and so forth. And in that, you know, as kind of some final points, one of the things was like, how do you what do you what do you do to get going if you want this in your organization? And the first thing that we put was, you know, you got to start the conversation about why people have to understand what the compelling reason is uh, in order to see some relevance in the training. So I completely agree with you there. You know, when it comes to designing training, there are a bunch of different models for this. And this will be interesting, I think, for some of our people out there in the world of organizational psychology, because these actually are oftentimes more talked about in organizational development fields or in the instructional design world, um, but can be very helpful for us to keep in mind. So, you know, one of the more popular ones is what's called the ADDIE model, A-D-D-I-E. And that stands for analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation as being one way to approach training design. And we're going to walk through those steps kind of packaged in a slightly different way because I like like the way that we're going to talk about it um, a little bit more. But we're going to kind of unpack that for for our listeners here today. Yeah. So this is coming back to that thing that the training needs to be systematic. Right. Yeah. You don't just do this, you know, at a whim. And, and then I also think, you know, we're going to talk about just conducting a block of instruction type of thing. But if you're really looking for those outcome training needs to be like, do they have that information? Has it been taught to them? Are we observing it out in the wild? Right. So we can. And then are we coaching out in the end? So if you want that holistic thing that I think would probably come under more the definition of learning. Right. Or that kind of learning organization, growing organization, that kind of thing. You really got to have more. That, but here we're just focusing on kind of conducting this block of instruction. Right. And the first place to start, step number one, is a needs assessment. This is where you've got to figure out what kind of training is needed. And this sounds obvious. However, organizations don't do this frequently. They, they will see a training that looks like something that they kind of want, and they'll just go with it. The danger with that is you could end up with some sort of training that everyone, maybe everybody already knows it, right? Everybody, they all know what you're training them on, and then they're just bored, and it's a waste of money. You know, if you ever do that, like let's say you you go into an organization to provide some training, and there wasn't a sufficient needs assessment up front, if everybody's looking at you like, oh my gosh, we all already know this, (laughs) you know what happened, right? There was not sufficient needs assessment. And there are kind of three parts of that. And the first one is figuring out what the organization needs, right? What what are the kind of those strategic needs? So Chris, what might be some ways, how would you figure out what the organization kind of needs? Well, so I think there's different types of surveys and interviews that you can do, but that's one of the ways that we kind of assess if there's some maturity in that. Hey, so what do you think the top three training needs for your organization Mm -hmm. are right now? And if somebody's like, um, I, well, we have this list of trainings that we do. Well, then we know that like, hey, we need to hone in on helping them assess what the organization needs. Right. Yeah. Now, and it, it can't just be interviews, though. Right? right. Because, you know, one or you can't just be uh, like some kind of assessment or survey. One, those assessment surveys need to be de- designed by somebody that knows what they're doing. Right. <laughs> but something's better than nothing. But then also going and doing some interviews with key stakeholders and finding like, hey, where are the gaps? 
because you you survey the whole organization, the majority of people are the individual contributors, yeah, and it'll skew your results that oh well, I think I need this and this, but it you need to tie what the lay people think with the direction of where the company's going. Are is there a strategy of entering a new market? Have you even done some discovery of what are those training pieces? What are the skills we need tomorrow? Okay, we got a good handle of what we need today. We got a good program, but are we really future looking for where we might be going? You're exactly right. And, you know, it's funny when I pose this question sometimes to my students, it takes them a while to figure this out, but it's like, hey, you got to figure out what your strategy is, where the organization is heading. Exactly like you said, talk to those senior leaders and hopefully they have a clue of where the organization is headed. Uh, but that first step of needs assessment is, what are we get? What are the skills? What are the what's the knowledge? What needs to happen in terms of the behaviors of our workforce for us to succeed tomorrow, not just today? And figuring that out is is definitely the first step. So needs assessment start with assessing the organization. You also got to look perhaps at the actual job, right? If it's a, a specific type of training devoted at a certain type of job within the organization, see what that job entails. Uh, also looking at the people, right? So. Uh, understanding who your audience is. And, you know, if most of the times you don't have this luxury, but if you're, if you can doing some sort of pre-assessment can be really powerful, right? If you can assess their knowledge or skill level before you do the training, then you can tailor, okay, this is kind of the level at which we need to deliver. And you could also, if you do that, if you have that pre-test data, right? So you have that pre um, or pre uh, intervention data, I should say, uh, then you can look at afterwards, right? If, as long as you can link everything up, you can say, look, we did this training and this is the result, right? So that can be helpful. Cult um, Culture is so important to that piece because people front at work. <laughs> Everybody wants to look like they know everything, do everything, and gosh darn look good in a suit, right? Or pants dress or whatever, right? So if you give an assessment to a bunch of people that has tons of questions they don't know, if you don't have a culture that allows us to stretch and reach, you might not get the results that you really want. Mm -hmm. Somebody may walk out of the test and, you know, because they don't want to display that they don't know those kinds of things. So be careful in how you're designing those pre interventions because it can have a negative cultural impact if you don't handle with care. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, you know, in the next step, so you, let's say you do this needs assessment, you figure out what the organization needs, you figure out what the people need, what the job entails. Then it's about setting some learning objectives. This is about trying to figure out, you know, what types of things should the people who go through this training be able to do after they go through. And yeah. And know, we, we started off with our learning objectives at the beginning of this episode. Yeah. To some but degree to, yeah. today, you're going to, what is training and why does it matter? <laughs> Ways yeah. to design training so that it helps people learn, right? I mean, right. these aren't fully fleshed out. Like this, these are not learning objectives for a official training program, but we're still using those kinds of concepts. Yeah, and I guess a, a recommendation that I would have for anyone who's trying to write some learning objectives or come up with them is, you know, you want to avoid kind of the lame uh, words that, that sometimes are used with these, right? You you want to avoid the ones that don't have clarity aren't things you can observe, can't measure them, right? So things, oftentimes you'll see learning objectives like, well, we want people to learn X, Y, or Z. Well, I get it, but that's not an easy thing to necessarily, that's kind of vague, right? Or appreciate or understand or know. What can be even better is to say things like, you know, we want people to be able to demonstrate X, Y, or Z. We want people to outline this, list these, be very specific in your learning objectives because then you can tailor all of your training design to those, those objectives. And you can also kind of preview of coming attractions. You can also look at how, uh, at, at an assessment later to see if they actually acquired that knowledge or skill. Yeah. So, Cause if they don't, you're going to have to go back and change your training. Right? right. Yeah, exactly. So set those learning objectives, make sure that they are ones that are clear, that they're measurable, that they're observable. And then you can start to design your training activities, right? So a lot of times I see organizations, I see trainers who just jump to kind of this step, or maybe they don't even go to this step. They just see a training and are like, hey, that looks good. This is where you can start to actually design what the training involves. And there's lots of different tools you can use. How are you going to convey this information? How are you going to get people to 
engage with the material. You know, oftentimes we kind of default to the lecture, but there's lots of different ways that you can you can teach people. And um, I, I think a kind of a combination approach is usually better uh, than just one singular approach. Yeah, games can be good. I know we've got several organizations that actually use episodes of the Indigo podcast in their L and D. You know, like it's actually part of the way they develop leaders within their organizations, which, you know, that's, that's the idea of just getting away from the droning lecture. Somebody up front with a bad PowerPoint, just reading the slides, people looking at their phones and falling asleep, you know, engaging content. And this all comes under that training design, right? Yeah. Which would Google some of that stuff. Good training designs. Take a look. You know, if you were to build a house, Ben, like, yeah, I guess, you know, you could just put a Connex out and it would meet the standards of a house. But if you really want to build a house, you can actually work with an architect because you've seen so many cool houses and ideas. That's the whole thing with Pinterest. You start pinning those different ideas. Well, if you're in training design, start pinning those ideas for things that you saw in training you liked. Maybe yeah. talk to your friends. What were some cool trainings you went to? You know, and start finding those kinds of things. And if you want to be relevant and hip in this space with the cool <laughs> kids, so to speak, just make sure that you have a pulse on those emerging trends and kind of what they look like. So your stuff, your content stays relevant. You don't want to yeah. be like a 1986 YouTube video. There wasn't even YouTube in 86. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I don't care how old you are. People don't like being bored. We just don't. And this is actually something we discussed a little bit was you were prepping for this episode was, you know, the ideas around adult learning theory and how different it actually is from how children learn. Right. I, I think I don't care how old you are. I think having variety and making things relevant and interesting and exciting. We all appreciate that. I don't think there's some magical age you reach at which it's like, oh, now I want relevance. No, now I'd like to not be bored to tears. Um, so I think it's a, a corny a bad joke is better than a speech without any jokes. <laughs> you know, like at least take an at bat on making your stuff hip, right? Like, yeah. So, you know, once you design all these different training activities, you know, these should be, of course, linked to your learning objective saying, okay, learning objective number one, how are we going to help, you know, with this, this item? Um, have some training activities. Then you want to look at, a sequencing of those training activities and how you might put those in a logical order uh, that makes sense, that is easy to follow, uh, you know, and then just really tactical things like how long is this going to take? And maybe people might want to like take a little break at this point and go, you know, drink a cup of coffee or hit the restroom like that. That type of stuff is actually really important when you're designing training. Um, then you want to go back and, and try to re revise some of your design details. So kind of hone what you've already come up with some ideas, you know, get some feedback from those people who might know, right? Maybe even talk to some of the actual training participants, some of your target audience, uh, or the people who are very familiar with them. And then you can start to build uh, what's called a training map. And this is just a simple document. I find this to be really helpful, especially when I'm doing a training for the first time. Just a, a little table that says, okay, here's my learning objective, like column one, right? Column two, Here's some activities and what I'm going to do to help support that learning objective. And then column three, my estimation of how much time that's going to take just to keep yourself on track. So you're, you're moving in a, you know, through all of your learning objectives in a logical way. Uh, you know, so if you're out there purchasing training as a, as a, as an organization and vendors are coming at you, you know, this is the type of thing I would want to, you know, encourage you to look for, uh, look for what are your learning objectives? Tell me how this all links together. All right. So we've talked about needs assessment, setting your learning objectives, designing your training activities, sequencing those training activities, revising those design details. The last one is evaluation, evaluating that result. Um, this is one that oftentimes gets missed, I think, Chris. Yeah. I mean, you're tired after the gauntlet of going through it, getting, <laughs> getting it agreed, aligning with the strategy. Probably so many meetings you want to puke if you have to even think about another meeting about the training. Yeah. Then you then you finally uh, a beta it. Now you got to go evaluate and put the final sheen. This is what separates the pros from the hacks, right? Is evaluate the total result. Like what is the reaction of the people that are sitting in there? You know, sometimes you could even put up a little, you know, 
camera and like film participants or something while you're delivering it. You should yeah. film if you did if you're about to deliver and you just did a train the trainer and you're concerned about the training that's going across your enterprise level organization. You want to have some way of evaluating the way your trainers are delivering, right? Yeah. Well, and this is also an interesting topic for um, you know, the the outside vendor who's coming in to do training for you. Because you think about it, you're an organization, you purchase this training from someone from the outside. They probably want to continue doing training with your organization. There is a, I would say there's, there's an incentive for them to not do the evaluation piece, you know, because they, they don't want there to be any possibility of there being negative reactions and they want to keep doing business with you. If they're a great vendor, though, they will have something built in to do this, right? So that they can continue to deliver something of value. And um, don't so be ready to stone them. Like right. if you see some negatives, you just make, oh, do we need a calibration? Yeah. You know, there's, I see a lot of throwing the baby out with the bathwater of, oh, we'll let the vendor take the fall. Well, one, that's not cool. That's somebody else's family and, and hard work and effort. Um, but the second thing is like any nothing's perfect. And so you need Great to be point. pragmatic and how you're evaluating like, oh, OK, we just need to spruce this on the, the second you know, iteration. We'll we'll change this one piece. Yeah. Well, so the most common way to look at evaluation of training, and some people have critiques of this, um, love to get, you know, maybe we'll do an episode with one of these folks who does this a lot more um, and has some ideas around other ways to evaluate training. But one of the more um, common ways is the the Kirkpatrick levels of training evaluation. And so the first one, as Chris already mentioned, is reactions. So you get people's reactions. You say, you know, what did you think of this training? That's the easiest type of data to collect. It's not uh, necessarily that informative other than I liked it. I didn't like it, uh, but it, it is a level of training evaluation. The next one, though, is learning. And this is where you would actually assess whether or not they learned something from the training. Now, it's a little tricky if you only assess this via a test or a survey or something afterwards, because you don't know if that's due to the training or if it's just something they knew already if you didn't do a pretest. So it's it's oftentimes great to have your need your assessment, uh, your needs assessment be, be tied to your um you know to your actual evaluation afterwards or something thereof, right? Where you and if it's pre if it's a long training, maybe you have some intermediate test as this thing. So if it's a great six point. month training program, yeah, don't, don't wait, wait to the end. That's too much. You it'll be hard to parse. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then you can't calibrate. Right. Uh, and then the next level is behavior. So seeing if people actually act in different ways based upon the training. Now the requirement here though, is that you have to wait until people go back to their jobs. You have to give it some time. Uh, and you might, for example, get evaluations from people's supervisors say, have you noticed that, you know, are people doing anything differently or can you right. rate this? That's, that's the behavior level. And then results level is usually referring to more organizational or team level results. You know, we did this sales training. Did sales actually go up? That's results level. There's a lot of other variables that can come into play there. Uh, but that is, you know, kind of a, a, a higher level of training evaluation. So, okay. Um, let's talk a little bit. So those are some kind of six steps to consider when designing training. Let's talk about training delivery a little bit. Yeah. So, just in case you thought that, hey, this is your cohort, yeah, that's still pilot mode. Now, now you have something that's been evaluated, pre-test, beta, designed, sequenced, all that stuff. Now you're actually ready for prime time that this can be an ongoing piece of training that can go into your org. First one, <laughs> don't be boring, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody likes it. We just don't like being bored, bored uh, it, you know, regardless of our age, especially if we're busy and maybe we didn't really want to be at the training to begin with. Like we, it needs to be engaging for people. Uh, so another way to do that is to keep it focused on the learner, keep it relevant to things that they actually can use in their job. A whole nother topic, which we're not really going to touch on too much today, but you know, I think is relevant is this idea of training transfer, you know, so you can learn a bunch of stuff, but do you actually take it back to, to the job? And right. by having it be stuff that's really relevant, that can, can help, that can support it. There's other things too, but that's one thing. Um, and then as we already mentioned, use a variety of methods, right? You know, if you put out a bunch of stuff, say, hey, you must read this before you come to the training. Some people might read it. A lot of people might not. 
you know, <laughs> um, maybe even provide time during the training for people to read something short, uh, use videos, lecture activities, you know, various things as in teams, you can do presentations. There are myriad ways that you can get people involved and engaged. And I encourage you to explore them all uh, as, as part of your kind of toolkit that you use when designing training. And, you know, one of the things that I like to use that I don't see a whole lot of people do is like org fit. So Mm -hmm. lots of times, like I'll go in like with agile transformations, right? Everybody knows how to scrum. They understand the agile methodologies, but then there's something in the organization that prevents them from executing on. There's this cognitive dissonance. Like, wait a minute. I was told that character and integrity meant this. I go to my job and I'm asked to do this thing that doesn't have character or integrity. And and you don't want to paint the pig out of reality, right? And so then, and here's the other thing. If you have crap training, if you have stinky training, people are just going to expect more stinky training. Their expectations, mm-hmm. they're, you know, one of my things that we'd get on our kids' uh, report card when they were like in kindergarten, first grade was, ready was today a ready to learn day if you want the people in your organizations to show up at your training ready to learn it you you can't have this pantheon of bad training that they've already been to that that they just expect garbage their minds are already shut down that's going to be hard to turn that cultural dynamic around but then on this other side culture org fit of your training Make sure that your own organization's living up to the values, the skills, the abilities, those kinds of things that you're daggone saying that you're expecting from your training that you're giving. Yeah, yeah, great points. Got to have that that fit there. You know, another tool that, uh, you know, we can explore, uh, I think, in future episodes is the idea of using games. And so there's a whole host and kind of this burgeoning area of research and thought around how various types of training can be gamified, so to speak. Uh, And we'll get an expert on here to talk more about that. But you can even use simple games to teach things. And I'm reminded of a a little session that I had the pleasure of being a part of of about 10 years ago or so, where this guy named Tiagi, and Tiagi, that's that's short for a very long name. Tiagi is this kind of legend in the uh, instructional design training delivery type of field. And we'll put a link to his website. But his idea is that, you know, anything that you're teaching to adults can be taught with a game. And anything that you teach to adults should be taught with a game. And so he has a bunch of free games on his website. And I think he probably has ways that you can pay him or his organization to provide you with other games. But I think the idea, I don't know if that's necessarily true. That's kind of an empirical question, whether or not you can teach everything with a game. But I think there is some value there in thinking about how you can have interactive, um, engaging experiences with people that help them learn a concept. Yeah, because it it comes out of the realm of the mind. Like I could spend 20 years lecturing you about boxing and we'd say this all the time. Well, here's a book book on boxing. Now get in the ring, Jack Wagon. You know, but (laughs) like we could go through, we could just, you know, look at a YouTube video with all kinds of punches and and dodges, review famous fights. And you would have such, you know, as the years went by, you'd have such a detailed knowledge of watching boxing, but you'd have next to nothing, next to nothing about what it feels like to take a punch and recover and how to, how it actually works when you're against an opponent in real time. Games help you do a bit of that rehearsal. That's another role-playing rehearsals. You know, like if you can go to an element of performing that task within a job environment, Like, cool, now we're going to go simulate the job environment and do it. All right, now we're going to come back and learn. All right, what did we learn? Games, all these things are just solidifying that functional learning. There's probably a really detailed science term for what I'm talking about, but that gets you to done on, do the people have mastery of this, you know, issue? Right, right. So what I'm taking from what you were just saying is that if I'm sitting on the couch playing Call of Duty, uh, that I'm not actually serving my country? No. <laughs> yeah. And, and I won't even, even if you said you'd go, I, I'm not going to put a, a M16 in your hand and head over to <laughs> that's, Afghanistan that's right. with you. No way, buddy. You got a gauntlet of training. You're going to have to do and demonstrate, right? That's right. That's right. You know, it's la- <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing too because um, in the Navy, I don't know if we still have this, but for a while we had an online training on how to assemble and disassemble and reassemble um, 
a weapon like an M4. Uh, and, but and you guys it, don't do it every day, right? We don't. But it was funny because, but it was so hard because, like, you know. But but you know, having gone through both, doing it, doing the online training of how to, you know, take apart this weapon and put it back together, and then actually doing it, like you learn it way better just actually doing it, you know, with a piece of metal in your hand. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, let's move on from there. We've talked a little bit here about what training is and why it matters. We've talked about some ways to design training so that it doesn't stink and so it actually helps people learn. Now let's move on to some specific key takeaways for people, leaders, and organizations. So what are some good takeaways for people here at the individual level? Like, listen, you can't control what quality. You find yourself in a job, an organization, you can't control. You're just a person, right? But one of the things you can do is you can actively engage with the materials. Start yeah. writing at some point if you move up the ladder, right? Which you want to move up the ladder if that's something that's in your heart, right? Write down, this is what went well, what didn't. Engage actively. J even with crap training, if you're the only person that's just like, all right, I'm all in, and you're not having a bad attitude, that's going to stick out to people that are observing. Mm -hmm. You know, gee, that was really garbage training, but Ben was paying attention, taking notes, and didn't complain. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can, I've done a lot of training and I've taught a lot of classes and, you know, if you have one person, especially if that person kind of has um, various characteristics of leadership and people kind of like that person, if that person starts turning on the trainer and starts, you know, oh, this is garbage, blah, 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 right. <laughs> about it, then, you know, you can really start to make the, ne the experience negative, even if it was well-designed training. And so don't be that person be a positive participant. And Hey, if, if you're in training that stinks, it's not going well. And if you have the ability, you know, this is actually an opportunity for you to stand out. If you can try to help improve what's going on, uh, volunteer to teach some sections of, of whatever the, the uh, learning is about and, um, try to provide some good feedback to help improve it. Uh, these are key opportunities for you. And I think that, you know, just by kind of, uh, saying, Oh, this training stinks. Um, that just absolves yourself of the responsibility. No, that's not being a leader. There's uh, no leadership up. in that statement. Right. You're just a non-helpful scumbag, right? At that point. <laughs> now, and it total, can be true. Total jack wagon. But, you know, and if it's endemic and you're a VP or CEO, maybe you can stand up and be like, I'm tired of our training stinking. Sure. Well, then go. But then you got to do something about it. So if you're an individual, these, this is a great time to be like, hey, you know, I think I can conduct that block of training and maybe improve our materials. Do you mind? People will generally be like, man, you can make it better. Sure. You know, we got so much on our plate. This is a way to show that you're actively engaged in the organization and you're going to be better than other numbskulls because you're going to think about the Addy process that we're, and the stuff that we're teaching you here, thinking about that process on how you'll help improve that and how you're going to share your knowledge with others. Right. You know, another thing at the individual level about training is this is just a great opportunity for you to really get some exposure and experience by helping to teach, helping to, you know, uh, onboard new people. Those types of trainings can be really great for you professionally. And, you know, it also helps you master new material. It's, it's fascinating. You know, you think about your work with guitar students, Chris. Uh, learning is one thing, how to do things yourself. When you try to teach it to another person, that's another level altogether. And that can really start to solidify the learning for yourself. So what are some key takeaways for leaders in organizations uh, with regard to training? Well, this is where if you're at the manager, senior manager, director on a role level, right? You're not going to be able to do all that training yourself. Well, maybe in a smaller organization, you can't. But you have a vested interest in the quality of the training that your team receives. So you need to make yourself a partner with, not a hostile agent to, but a partner <laughs> with the learning and development or HR part, whoever handles the who comes in and trains, how we design that train. You need to work with them to develop meaningful learning objectives and other things. That, that Because this is going to determine the quality, well, I'm not going to say existential quality, but what kind of learning and the functioning of your team on key skills and abilities that you're going to need to push the organization forward and to demonstrate your quality as a leader. Right. You know, another thing you should do as a leader is look out for your people and make sure that they're getting training that they need, training that actually helps them. And it's training that doesn't stink. You know, you don't have to tolerate this as a leader. You should be demanding and expecting and supporting good training for your people. 
you know, another thing that you can do is to make sure that, you know, people on your team are able to train others and that they know how to do that. This is a great way to develop people's leadership skills. It's a stretch assignment, you know, to help people develop their own skills is to train other people. And uh, that's just a, a really great thing that you can do for your folks. Yeah. And then as a leader, you need to have a meaningful way to evaluate the quality of training that your teams receive. So don't just be like, well, I think this is garbage. You need to have some quantitative ways. So when you go to have that conversation with your training people within your org and say, hey, listen, based on the, the Addy framework or whatever, you know, this isn't just me saying I don't like you or that teacher. This is, you know, this is a quantitative evaluation of what's going. And look, here's how I'm capturing how my team's performing after your training, right? But it's it's not there. And here's the other thing is also is a lot of people don't. Now, the more mature enterprise organizations will say, you know, they'll have some kind of learning management system that can me measure how many people have been trained, how well they did, or, or how one exec that works in this space was telling me, I can tell all my senior leaders just click through. This is a 40-minute course. It takes the lay people 40 minutes. Ugh. They just click, 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 yeah. click. Oh, yeah, I did your training. And it's like the people in learning and development, like not only do they know that you click through the training real fast, but they can see when the lack of behavioral change in what you're doing that you, one, didn't give a rip about it and that you just pencil whipped it. And your team, <laughs> right. your team's severing. So as a leader, even if you feel that way, just know that people can see that. That's going to be bad for your brand. But yeah. back to your team. You got to have a quantitative way to evaluate that quality and then capture the learning. So you can say, listen, I need to get three of my new recruits into this class and it happening two years from now is the next time you're offering it doesn't work for me. Or, you know, you'd be able to have those strategic conversations. Yeah. And I would just encourage leaders to also, when they're thinking about evaluating training, to focus more on the learning and the behaviors and the results versus right. just reactions. You know, reactions are, are helpful. I mean, people probably should have a positive reaction or it's helpful sometimes. However, sometimes, as you would say, you got to eat your asparagus. You know, I've been through some training in my life, especially on the military side, that, that wasn't pleasant, but I did learn things. You know, I'm thinking in particular about the time that I became a certified oleoresin capsicum uh, trainer, which is pepper spray. Right. So I got pe <laughs> and part of that training is that you get sprayed in the face with pepper spray and then you have to run around and like fight people. And it is not pleasant <laughs> at all. Who wants you know? to be this trainer? <laughs> One, two, three, not it. <laughs> yeah. No, no, the trainer's got to spray you in the face. But anyway, yeah, it was so, you know, not pleasant, but you really do learn a lot going through that process. So sometimes you got to eat your asparagus. Or just here. think, you know, Galileo conducted the Earth's not the center of the universe training and then spent decades hiding <laughs> so he didn't get killed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, as a CEO, as a senior executive out there, I think you've got to make sure that HR, that your learning and development function knows the strategy of your organization. This helps with that initial phase of needs assessment so that they know where the organization is headed. And a good executive in the HR or the L&D function is going to say, hey, I, I now have a knowledge of, of, of where the organization is headed. And now my, in, from my perspective, I need to be thinking about what kinds of knowledge and skills do I need to start making sure I have in the workforce? And do, is that something that I, I buy in terms of hiring new people, or is that also something that I should be uh, building within my organization through training and development? So make sure that that's going on. Uh, at the organizational level, you know, I think there's also the need here to make sure that you're having quality training, have, this, have a good training audit, have some metrics behind these things too. Yeah. You guys need to know what's going on. So if you're, if you're a high level exec and you're not kind of familiar with like training and all that kind of stuff, you need to go just like, Go do a lunch and learn with the L&D people. <laughs> Some of them will be glad. Like, look, I've never seen somebody from the organization before. You know, <laughs> it's like go, go down to the dungeon and and really get your handles on what. And to Ben's point, audit that annually, quarterly, depending on the cadence of your and the maturity of your training organization. And those metrics are important. And, you know, we don't have time to do a deep dive into training metrics. Maybe we can do that on another episode. But make sure that those metrics are based in the science. Right, right. You know, it's also important to have some sort of plan for refreshing things as you go through uh, the years, right? So, you know, some training materials that were developed 10 years ago might not be relevant anymore, or they might just be so 
corny looking nowadays. The keyboard music is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that people just have this you know immediate negative reaction to it, and they stop listening. So you you want to make sure you have a kind of a refresh plan uh, in place, and you know also think about whether or not some of your training is best done via internal development or via external vendors. Um, there certainly are topics that you do not have the bandwidth or the expertise to address internally. And for that, you probably do need to look outside. Other things, you might be able to look inside, and it's good to to explore that as well. Yeah, and another good thing about bringing in some of these external vendors is you can see what the landscape. I know, I know you hate to get their emails. They're, they're you know, urchins looking for email <laughs> harassment. And you're like, God, <laughs> this is, you know, I get a thousand emails a day from vendors. But having a few of the leaders in your org for at least an annual demonstration or going to their website to check out or purchasing and having them as part of a portfolio of partnerships that help you allow can help raise the bar for your internal training, right? right. So you can kind of latch on to the kind of the methodology, the way in which they design those courses. Like, so that that can be helpful too. Right. And the last thing here is, you know, take a hard look at your learning management systems that you're using in your organization. Make sure it's something that is useful, that's giving you the metrics you need in order to evaluate what's going on uh, and uh, is easy for people to use. Yeah. So that you can spend a bunch of money on tech and get no results. Yeah. And then I've seen some people that just keep their training on PowerPoint files that are on a SharePoint site. Mm -hmm. And they refresh them and all those kinds of things. Their software helps you do certain things. And so, you know, determining who got trained across the organization, those kinds of things, that can be helpful. But beware of the, you know, bright, shiny tool actually not doing the work that it needs to do for you and your organization. Right. Remember, what you're trying to do is actually change people's behavior, change their knowledge or skill level, change some results within your organization. So. Today, we focused on the fact that corporate training doesn't have to stink. You can stop the numbskullery out there in its tracks. We talked about what is training, why it matters, some ways to design training so it helps people learn. And we followed up with some key takeaways for people, leaders, and organizations. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.